Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. Dr. Sarath Amanugamo, the Deputy Minister of Finance and Planning, is with us today to discuss the government's fiscal budget for 2013. Then, LMD columnist Samantha Amarasinghe outlines the key challenges facing Sri Lanka's economy. And finally, Nielsen's Managing Director Shaheen Carter analyzes the latest BCI data, which shows the unique index at a virtual standstill. That's the line for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. Budget 2013 drew mixed reactions. While some dismissed it as a budget for the super rich, uh, others questioned the lack of immediate relief for the man on the streets. But overall, Sri Lanka's 66th budget received the nod of approval. With a wage hike for state sector employees, um, increase in airport and online visa taxes, taxes on imported canned fish and as well as milk, as well as relief for drought-affected farmers and unutilized plantations to be developed by youth, the no cheers, no jeers budget seems to be like a step in the right direction. Here to offer his unique perspective, the Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. Sarath Amanugamam. Firstly, Dr. Amanugama, congratulations on your reappointment as the Deputy Minister of Finance and thank you for uh, agreeing to this interview on Benchmark. Now, there seems to be, when you look at the budget, what strikes us most is the President's, in the president's budget speech is the government's renewed focus on poverty alleviation. Now, there's 1.5 billion rupees that has been allocated for this. Any idea how this is going to be spent? Well, poverty reduction is one of the main focus of this budget. And Sri Lanka has a very good history of uh, investing in areas which has led to a dramatic reduction of poverty. Over one million people have climbed out of poverty during the last few years. As you know, uh, there are the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, by 2015, the global community uh, expects uh, that the Millennium Development Goals, which are about, I think, 10 in number, uh, would be fulfilled. Uh, this is a long process. Uh, this country has invested uh, in health uh, almost from the days of the State Council with rural health, uh, with family health programs, so that uh, we are now uh, in a situation where uh, the poverty levels are at a historic low. So government has decided to make this special investment uh, to uh, strengthen uh, existing uh, poverty uh, reduction programs. Uh, one cannot talk of uh, poverty uh, that you see in Asia, Africa and so on because here anybody who comes below that uh, poverty line is entitled to a regular uh, subsidy from the government at least as far as uh, basic food, you know, staple food items are concerned. Of course, you can uh, now confront the problem of just emerging out of poverty. It's not simply a statistic to say that so many people have come out of the $1 a day or $2 a day uh, demarcation line. Uh, we have to take them from beyond that to being uh, active members of the economy. But certainly in this budget, we are going to commit much more funds for those already ongoing programs for poverty reduction. So the general thrust of this uh, budget is to equalize, to give more chances to the people who are below the poverty line. Assuming that poverty will be a thing of the past within the next three years, it's always good to hope because that's a, that's a good aspiration to look forward to. What measures are being taken to actually expand the middle class, keeping in mind that this will boost spending and growth, and it is this class of people who will ultimately move into the middle class? Well, when you have uh, 7 to 8 percent growth, it converts itself in the uh, social arena as a growing uh, middle class. So a gr growing middle class 
means that it has more uh, disposable income. People are not spending merely uh, to survive but has some disposable income. And one of the characteristics of this new middle class is that in the past they have been investing heavily in consumption goods. Now if you take for example uh, the cell phones, uh, cellular phones, we have as many cellular phones in this country as our population. So that is we have uh, 20 million population and near 20 million cell phones in the country. Then the vast expansion of motorcycles, three wheelers, refrigerators, all those uh, elements which are the consumption items which are asked for by the middle class. So what we have done here is uh, try to encourage the local production both in food and uh, manufactured goods which can cater to the middle class. A lot of uh, concessions have been given to the uh, private sector to manufacture for the emerging middle class. Our thrust is that this should come basically from the country itself. The 2013 budget allocation for education has seen an increase and a welcome one at that. There is an allocation of 300 billion plus rupees, uh, which is an increase of 15 percent over 2012. Now, while acknowledging that it is good to see this increase, uh, Mr. Minister, next year's uh, budget allocation, however, is still less than 5 percent. Isn't this too little, too late? No, really, uh, one has to look a little bit uh, deeper into this education question. One, of course, is the question of allocations. What we find is that even the existing allocations are not fully utilized by the institutions and the authorities. Okay, let us leave that aside. The fact is that you can have financial allocations, but to what sectors or what areas are, is this money being directed? Uh, we see a big structural imbalance in the education system. Uh, to give you an example, uh, in the secondary uh, system, uh, of the 10,000 schools in the country, only 800 teach science. So, only 800 schools are equipped to teach science. I mean, it's a shocking figure. The others are uh, teaching what let us call them the soft subjects. I don't want to be invidious by identifying them. So, it is not a question of the total increase of the budget. It should be uh, prioritizing the money that we give them, uh, both in the university education and in the science education, so that the world of education can be linked up with the world of work. Otherwise, we are going to have a huge problem in the future. We have, we have educated unemployed, but educated in the un, unemployable areas. Whereas there are in expanding jobs which cannot be met by these people who are coming out of our education system. So, very, very uh, strong measures must be taken, not by simply uh, expanding the amount of money, which will be just gobbled up by salaries and various things, but by focusing that money into specific sectors. We take a quick break now for a message from our sponsors. In part two, Dr. Amanugama discusses the benefits of healthcare and SMEs, the three-year tax holiday for new listings on the Colombo Boss, and the prohibition of the sale of land to foreigners. Lots to look forward to. Stay with us. of your life is spent taking care of others, showing love in ways no other could. Now it's our turn to show you how much we care. Introducing Leosera from Morbitel, a special package for women with a free life insurance cover up to 500,000 rupees. Leosera, empowering women today for a secure tomorrow. Morbitel, we care always. If you're looking for a leasing company to make your wheels go round with fast, friendly and hassle-free service together with flexibility and the best interest rates in town let us show you how we can make your world go round People's Leasing Company We're the number one in leasing 
because pleasing people is our number one priority. Welcome back to the show. We now continue with our budget discussion and analysis with uh, Dr. Sarath Amanugama, Deputy Minister of Finance. Now, Dr. Amanugama, healthcare is being taken seriously and that is to be commended given the status of our aging population as well as the increasing incidences of non-communicable diseases like diabetes and other age-related illnesses. Still, the outlay for the state sector is only 125 billion rupees. Given the state of our rural hospitals and the general uh, communities, don't you think this is just insufficient? Well, if you look at the demographics of our uh, country, uh, we are going to see a population increase up to 2020. Then from 2020, it is going to plateau. So that just now we are seeing the heightening demand up to 2020 every year there will be bigger people who numbers of people who will seek these services but after 2020 it will begin to flatten out or even decrease so we are seeing a time when more and more people will be seeking health services uh, our view is that this can't be done entirely by the uh, government by itself as you see, a lot of the private sector will go into health. Today, uh, health and education, which were earlier in the old uh, dispensation thought to be monopolies of the state, simply because the private sector was not interested in going into these areas. So, this, finally, the state, what was called the nanny state, had to look after these two little uh, backward children. But now the nanny state concept is gone. These are areas where there is a lot of um, investment and a lot of free market operations. So I envisage a future when there will be strict, there will be competition between the public sector and the private sector. In the meanwhile, the government is ensuring that those who are at the bottom will have uh, health uh, facility. Well, it would definitely seem that small business has been a beneficiary of the budget proposals with enterprises uh, with an annual turnover of less than 12 million uh, gaining the benefit of not having to pay VAT or NBT. One feels, however, that the turnover ceiling is not enough as given that our inflation remains at about 9%. Well, in the first place, one of our targets in this budget is to bring inflation down to 7%. That's a very, very uh, important uh, target. Now, when it comes to the SME, if you see the uh, economic growth, particularly in Asia, that was fueled mostly by the SMEs, it's not by the very big uh, companies, because the big companies can economize only if there is this value chain, where a lot of small and medium scale entrepreneurs produce the goods that can feed into the bigger uh, production units, either in, the, in, the, in that country or even in neighboring uh, industrial centers. So, in Sri Lanka, the immediate need for expansion, if we want to get uh, dramatic GDP growth, then we have to build up our small and medium scale enterprises. That is where the potential is. That is where there is a lot of, shall I say, space, space to grow. Now, take, for example, our rural agriculture. We have to move from subsistence agriculture to commercial agriculture, even in matters like rice, vegetables. Uh, fruits and things like that. Why can't we export? Take Bangladesh, they are exporting fruit, they are exporting rice. They are, they are less organized than us, but they are, that's a big uh, money earner. Now with tourism and with tourism growing in the region, there are tremendous possibilities for small and medium scale enterprises to grow. So one of the philosophies of uh, this government and indeed planning in Asia is that they should concentrate very much on expanding the capacity of small and medium scale enterprises and link it to the bigger enterprises. Speaking of the ease of doing business index and also our country profile, um, the radical proposal to prohibit the sale of land to foreigners, now how is this going to be viewed overseas, uh, especially in these indices and in our rankings and also the diaspora, uh, which has been very active in our real estate development. I was the one who brought this earlier when I was the Minister of Finance. That deals with 
purchase of land basically for housing. You see, now what happened was that the local population got crowded out in all the uh, scenic spots, in the uh, desirable spots, because uh, they couldn't afford to compete with the foreign investors. But foreign investors can uh, get, uh, they can uh, buy land by paying that uh, extra tax and also uh, we, we are going to have quite a liberal uh, you know, leasing systems. Any investor can lease out land in Sri Lanka. This means that they are prohibited uh, from leasing land or building in Sri Lanka. But when it comes to uh, small plots where the local people have to get some preference, uh, they can't be crowded out. The CEB and the CPC, two of our largest state-owned utilities uh, making so much loss. CPC uh, made a loss of over 90 billion rupees last year and the CEB uh, in the red by as much as 26 billion rupees. If this is the case, Mr. Minister, both have been cited by COPE reports as being uh, for mismanagement and fraudulent activities. How come we don't see anything uh, in this budget to right the situation? I have gone on record saying that these large state-owned enterprises have to be reformed uh, drastically because they are, they are a drag on our economy. So why isn't someone listening to you? No, it's a very complicated issue. Now, in the first place, uh, there are certain things that we can't control. Now, both the uh, Electricity Board and the Petroleum Corporation really depend on imported oil. When the, when the uh, oil bill goes up or it comes down, it severely affects the the balance sheets of these two corporations. We can't get out of that as long as we don't uh, have full control over the production and distribution of energy, then uh, I, I don't think we can put the blame entirely on them. But having said that, uh, there has to be several policy and administrative decisions to see that within this ambit that uh, we can at least save the situation because uh, today what has happened is in far as the state-owned enterprises are concerned, the state pays for them. Embedded in it of course are the, uh, are the subsidies and things like that because the state is the uh, person who picks up the tab and I think the time has come when they must be, they must be independent entities with their own uh, pricing policies and so on. So partly, uh, to be fair by them, they are in this situation because the state has introduced so many uh, restrictions, policy restrictions, so many subsidies are brought in. But again, finally, it is the state that uh, refunds these institutions. So I think next year, as it has been mentioned in the budget, we need to take a very, very serious look at these. Not only these two, there are a few others also. All these have to be looked into and put on a steady course. We can't go on like this. Thank you very much, Dr. Amunagama, for talking to us and giving your views on Budget 2013. That was our discussion with Dr. Sarath Amunagama, Deputy Minister of Finance. On the other side, we have Shaheen Khader, Managing Director of Nielsen, and Economist and LMD Columnist Samantha Amarasinghe. the way you connect with the new Mobitel Remix. Enjoy free M2M voice minutes, SMS data, fast minutes and 50% discounts on excess data and three fabulous add-on prepaid packages. Dial hash 649 hash to activate. Mobitel. We care. Always. If you're looking for a leasing company to make your wheels go round with fast, friendly and hassle-free service. Together with flexibility and the best interest rates in town. Let us show you how we can make your world go round. People's Leasing Company. We're the number one in leasing because pleasing people is our number one priority.
Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Nishu Hashim, an LMD columnist and economist Samantha Amar Singha is with me now to discuss the state of the economy. Now, Samantha, given the economic outlook that is subject to both internal and external risks, what are the key challenges that our economy faces? The key challenges, we believe, um, are its high fiscal deficit um, and the threat of uh, high and uh, volatile oil prices. Um, inflation risks are also lurking in 2013, um, largely due to external factors, um, the possibility that oil and food prices uh, might edge higher. Um, as you know, oil imports uh, comprise approximately 25% of uh, Sri Lanka's total um, imports, mm -hmm. and uh, higher oil prices uh, could worsen Sri Lanka's fiscal position. Um, also, the risk of uh, global oil price shocks uh, could place the balance of payments under uh, pressure again and uh, shrink the fiscal space. In this month's issue of LMD, you said that there has been an improvement in the balance of payments. Now, could you elaborate on why this is so? The cumulative trade deficit, um, in fact, for the first nine months of this year, declined by 0.3%. Um, and uh, this was the first such decline uh, since December 2009. And uh, although exports growth has been on a decelerating trend over the last nine months, um, imports expenditure has uh, continued to respond uh, to the central bank's uh, uh, very tight policy measures. So what we've seen is uh, consumer goods imports decline uh, quite substantially um, due to motor vehicle imports, um, which have been subject to uh, higher taxes. Um, so overall, we're expecting uh, the balance of payments to remain in surplus, and uh, this has always been supported by uh, strong workers' remittances and higher earnings from tourism, um, which both uh, continue to cushion the current account. and. Uh, that said, the surplus, however, is somewhat lower than we expected as uh, capital inflows have fallen short of targets. Uh, but having said that, uh, the inflows have been steady and uh, this is what has uh, boosted reserves uh, to a comfortable uh, 7 billion US dollars um, as at end of September. Um, in fact, the governor uh, made some comments this morning um, stating that the central bank is expecting a $260 million surplus this year and uh, 780 million next year. Um, but uh, this is very much contingent on uh, capital inflows uh, receiving a boost um, with a slight uptick uh, we're expecting in global growth and on improved risk sentiment next year. What about the trade deficit, Samantha? Export growth has dropped over the past nine months and is expected to remain sluggish for the rest of the year. Now, what sensitivities have led to this situation and do you think it will recover? Um, the sensitivities leading to sluggish export growth um, include the euro area crisis um, and also its possible intensification. And uh, we also feel uncertainty over the US fiscal cliff has uh, contributed uh, to this. Both these factors uh, might deepen the country's slump in exports uh, witnessed over the past six months. Um, we might see a modest recovery in exports um, as we do expect uh, global growth to improve as we move through uh, 2013. But the difficult external environment and uh, weaker demand from the West is likely to persist. And do you see room for easing in inflationary pressures? Um, we think inflationary pressures are likely to persist in the near term. Um, risks remain high um, and the prolonged droughts in uh, southern and eastern Europe, uh, coupled with natural disasters in the US, might uh, push up food prices in international markets, uh, at least in the first half of next year. Um, headline inflation is expected to inch higher um, this quarter due to upward revisions um, in administered prices of fuel and electricity um, and also supply side constraints uh, due to crop damage uh, caused by adverse uh, weather conditions in the northeast which we experienced uh, in early November on account of uh, cyclone Neelam. However, uh, we expect inflation to moderate uh, by uh, the second quarter of next year due to uh, improved domestic supply and also buffer stocks, uh, while the government's uh, prudent wages policy uh, should also suppress near-term uh, wage demand pressures. That was economist and LMD columnist Samantha Amarasinghe. When we return, Anushin Selvaraja speaks to Shahin Kada on the Business Confidence Index. Stay tuned. The prepaid broadband offer of the year. Now with every new connection, get free data up to 8 GB and 6 months validity for just 2012 rupees. Mobitel. We care. Always. 
if you're looking for a leasing company to make your wheels go round. With fast, friendly and hassle-free service. Together with flexibility and the best interest rates in town. Let us show you how we can make your world go round. People's Leasing Company. We're the number one in leasing because pleasing people is our number one priority. The prepaid broadband offer of the year. Now with every new connection, get free data up to 8 GB and 6 months validity for just 2012 rupees. Mobitel. We care. Always. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraja and with me now is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. Now, uh, Shaheen, the BCI failed to move either way uh, and was at a virtual standstill and it only went down by one basis point in November. Now, it is still above the average for the last 12 months but still well below where it was a year ago. Now, what sensitivities have led to this idleness, so to speak, uh, in our business confidence? Yeah, I think uh, the I think the field work for for the November phase was done in the first week of November. So budget was soon after. I feel the the index was more or less flat because people were waiting. Con the business people were waiting the outcome of the budget. So there was a element of uncertainty at the time. I think that's really why the index is flat. Is, is flat. So we'll have to see next month whether the budget has been received optimistically or pessimistically. How does the business community view our economy at present, considering the bleak global economy and its impact on our domestic markets? Well, uh, Amshan, the BCI is actually down compared to a one exactly about a year back. It's about 30% down. So obviously the business community is concerned because exports are impacted due to the global economy and also the Middle East uh, changes have really, uh, especially Iran and North Africa, have impacted our uh, traditional tea markets. So, uh, therefore, there is concern and also I think in the next three months, um, the business outlook is not really positive, it's more or less more towards negative for, for business per se, despite the onset of the shopping season in December. Shaheen, there's been a sudden shift though in how the business community views our investment climate with a clear majority of 55% saying that it is good. Now, with the global economies facing um, severe recessionary times, how is it possible that uh, sentiments regarding investment into our country are positive? Um, yes, actually what we, are, we have seen is that over the last five months, uh, in terms of the investment climate per se, uh, there is a sense of optimism which is coming back. Uh, and... Uh, of course, you know, one has to keep in mind that this is not necessarily about foreign investment. Uh, and there is a belief that with construction, tourism, and also infrastructure developments continuing, uh, investors in real estate coming in, so there is optimism that the investment climate is, is improving. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kara. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.